other things um, I wanted to mention was about when we do get back into sailing, and let, let, let's hope that's being optimistic in six weeks' time. We don't, we don't know exactly, but let, let's assume. And I, I know some of you might have been going anyway, but, you know, into more sort of group sailing. Um, what, I, what I want you to think about is it's been a long break since we've all done it properly, and it's quite easy to fall in the habit of not doing it. Now, I'm guessing the fact you've all turned up tonight is you're either really bored or you're really keen to get going. And what I would say is, um, like any sort of exercise, or you go swimming, running, whatever it is, make it a habit. Set aside some time in the every week that is your time to go sailing. And you're going to need somewhere between two and three hours to set aside as a block to give yourself a solid hour sailing. So set that time aside and make sure you stick with it. And even better still, make sure when we can, you meet up with an, someone else. So if you're single-handed, find another boat to go with. So you know you've both got a it's 10 o'clock Saturday morning. We're both committed. We're going to do this every week. And make sure you do it. Same with double-handed, another team to, to line up with. And it's just to make sure you, you go. I mean, what I've found in my training and everything else is if it's left to me, I'll never do it. But if there's a group pressure or I've made a commitment, then I'll go. So that's my bit. Um, I think we'll hand over to Gareth and uh, let him get technical. Right. Down to you, Gareth. Okay, I'm going to try the screen share. Oh. I might, I might take my hat off and get warm. Ooh. A bit. Okay. Mm. Right, can everyone see my screen? Oh, Jackie joining us there. Evening, Jackie, can you hear us? No. Uh, can you see the screen okay? Everyone good? Yep. Okay, <clears throat> so um, last week we looked at telltales and when the windward telltale flaps and the leeward telltale flaps tells us two different things. Uh, when the windward telltale flaps, it either means we need to bear away or we need to pull the sail in. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you about why that happens. And we're going to do a bit of physics study. And what's really funny here is I'm the art student. Carl's the one who did a degree in ship science. But anyhow, <laughs> I think that this taught me more about setting up a sail and setting up a boat and therefore it improved my understanding of what I was trying to do when I was sailing, what I needed to do to make my boat sail better and be more under control and sail faster and, and, and do better in races. So lift versus drag. And as I see, warning, trying to stay awake because uh, I'm going to try and make it simple by the end. But it is, um, it's beyond A-level physics, what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> Anyhow, right, here's a little video for you. Now, this is with an aerofoil. Oh, wait a minute. What happened there? Uh, okay. Back. What's going on with this stupid screen? Lift and drag. There we go. That's all we want. Lift and drag. Here we go. Okay, so here's a little video of an aerofoil in a wind tunnel with white lines of smoke blowing over it. Now, we can imagine that this is our mast here where my, my finger is pointing and that that edge of the aerofoil is our sail. And we're going to look at the way that the wind flows across a sail. Okay, let me just kick this in. Right. It's often said that... Oh. So, we can see the wind approaching the sail, and some of the wind is going behind the sail, and some of the wind is hitting the front, and it's all getting lost here. Okay, now if I play this video on, 
we can we're going to see a demonstration in a second that shows you how a sail works and what it is is that the wind that's going behind the sail moves faster than the wind that's moving along the front of the sail as we move this video along it's going to show you some these are blips of smoke going past and then the video will slow this down now here we can see the wind starting to approach the sail it's starting to take the shape of the sail before it reaches it. Now you can already see the wind that's going down the back of the sail is moving faster and has traveled completely past the sail before the wind on this on the on the windward side has got to the end of the sail. Have I lost anyone yet? Okay, silence, that's good. Right, and I'm just going to move on to another slide here and show you in this video what happens when we haul in a sail, when we change the angle of attack. So here's your sail and you can see the aerofoil shape is moving, the front is moving upwards, the back end is moving down and there's this patch here where it says reverse flow that is creating very disturbed air. So this is what happens when you oversheet your sail. So we can see the angle of attack has changed massively. The wind's really struggling to get around the sail. And on the windward side of the sail, it's still flowing past, but remember the windward side, it's moving slower. Okay, so now if I click this button, Okay, so what is drag? The easiest way to explain drag, uh, sorry, what is lift? That's the easiest, we'll start with that. <laughs> what is lift? Lift, the easiest way to explain lift is if you wind down the window in your car, you stick a flat hand out of the car window, and then if you turn the uh, thumb that's facing forwards uh, slightly upwards, so that the wind starts flowing and, and you're creating an, an aerofoil, then you'll feel your hand will shove up. Your hand will immediately re rise up and vice versa. If you move it the other way, your hand will go down. So lift in its simplest form is basically you angling your hand and therefore the wind makes your hand go up in the air. The drag bit is the wind coming towards you. And what's happening is, as you can see in the bottom of this diagram, on the lower side of your hand, you create high pressure. You're slowing the airflow down. And on the other side of the cell or hand, where the wind is moving past faster, you're creating low pressure. And as we know, when we watch the weather, high pressure always wants to go to low pressure. Therefore, you create lift. Still got everyone? Everyone? Okay, cool. So, when you're sailing upwind, lift equals going forwards, drag equals creating a break to stop you go forwards. I think we've still got everyone there. Okay, cool. Another thing that's quite interesting is our main sail shape. I'm introducing this here because this is apparent to our angle of attack, something I mentioned earlier and we saw in those aerofoil diagrams. So angle of attack is this line here going into the sail. Angle of attack on our main sail above in this diagram is, is, a, is, is a shallower angle than this sharp angle and here we've got uh, a sail where, the, where the, the maximum depth of the sail is quite far aft. Here we have one where it's quite far forward. So that would be if you pulled your Cunningham on or on a yacht with a, with a, a, a fixed uh, tack on its sail, if you pulled the main halyard very tight. And here you can see we've got a nice big draft and a very sort of regular aerofoil shape on all different types of boats, 
the depth of the uh, say the outhaul, the, you know, here can vary a, a considerable amount. Um, some works better with others. And now we're going to try and explain the reason for that. So causes for lift in sailing. This is a, a question to everyone. Can anyone guess a cause to give you increased lift, increased power when you're sailing? It's open mic session, so please shout in if you've got any answers. Got silence from the whole. Yeah, there's more curbing of sail. Oh, sorry, Darren, go ahead. And the more curves you have in the sail, the more lift you might have. Yep, that's good. Yep, excellent. Anyone else got an idea? There's a few here. So foil lifting when at pace. Yeah, so more speed, more wind speed, air speed. Yeah. That's good. All right. So power, wind speed, airflow, gusts, the thing you can't see when you're sailing. And yeah, like uh, Darren said, deflection, curvature, the shape of your sail, as we were just talking about in the last slide. OK, so causes for drag. Anyone got any causes for drag? Flatten sail. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a flapping sail. Yeah, so uh, that's angle of attack if we're talking physics. Yeah. Anyone else got one? Well, depth of the cord being too great. Yeah, that's good. A deflection, separation of airflow, too much curve. Yeah, exactly. We still got everyone in on this. Good. Okay, so the important thing to make our sail work efficiently is lift versus drag. How do we increase the lift and reduce the drag? Okay, so how do we increase lift and power? More wind, increase the angle of attack, increase the curve of the sail. That will always give you more power. You also have more wind, increase the angle of attack. Sorry, I've gone through the slide. Oh yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, but also remember, the more that we do all these things, so the more wind you have, the more you increase the angle of attack, and the more you increase the curve of the sail, you also increase the drag. So what we have to do is find a sweet spot. Here's a little diagram of uh, a graph showing you lift. Now, imagine that the boat is going in a constant direction. The wind speed is exactly the same. And this green line here going up, this green line will show you uh, what happens to the lift as you pull the sail in. And then as you oversheet, it goes back down the curve. So you're pulling the sail in to its optimum lift. And then when you're oversheeted, the lift curve goes down. So we're changing the angle of attack is pulling the boom in or out on your boat. Here I'm adding the drag curve. Now the drag curve is slightly different um, because drag uh, has a very different um, relationship to lift. So what we can see here is that drag is starting at you know one reasonable point here, and then the drag actually reduces as we're pulling our sail in. So we're minimalizing the, the, you know, the amount of drag there. And then as that sail gets pulled in, the drag increases because the wind is struggling to get past the sail to a point at the top where the sail's oversheated and the drag is exponentially higher than our lift and the sail is completely stalled. So what we're gonna look at here is the ratio between lift and drag, where we're working on the two mediums between the two to find the best point as we go along the, uh, left to right axis, the horizontal axis of this graph, graph, and where the blue line and the green line intersect, that is our sweet spot. Now, that's a lot to think in your head, isn't it, while you're sailing? But there's one really easy way to look at your sail and know when you're at that sweet spot. So how do we find that sweet spot? Anyone? Okay going out. Tell -tales. Tell -tales. Tell tales flying fluidly. Tell tales tell us everything. Oh. Okay.
So a few more questions for everyone. So the telltales in the picture show you that too much what is present. Anyone got an answer? A, B or C? You see the leeward telltale is, is fluttering away and the windward telltale on the inside of the curve is streaming nicely. Too much drag. Too much drag. Too much drag. Yeah. The leeward telltale is lifting, indicating the airflow is stalling, which creates too much drag. Nice one. All right, next question for you. Assuming the sail is fully sheeted in, should this sailor bear off? Anyone got an answer there? Yes. Yeah, the sailor should bear off, yeah. Answer, the windward telltale is lifting, indicating the airflow on the windward side of the sail is stalling. Bearing off for this, we'll, we'll, we'll correct this. Ignore that last bit. That doesn't make any sense. And I couldn't work it out to delete it because I need to PowerPoint. Um, right. Okay, last question. Once you're up to speed, flattening your sails will create less A, lift, B, drag, C, both. Must be both. Both. Yep. Yeah. Good work. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I didn't actually lose anyone on that and everyone kind of got the hang of it. That's great news. Yeah. So as you flatten your sails, you um, you will create less lift and drag. Yeah, no, exactly. So there's these other telltales on the back of the sail called leech telltales. And we can see in the two diagrams, one of them, all the telltales are heading behind the sail but we can see from the wind indicator in both shots, although the mast is slightly different angles, that the wind is in a constant direction. So you can see at the back of the uh, wind X, the arrow is, you know, is still on the two veins there. It's okay, so a one sail here on the left, all the telltales are backing, and on the right, all the telltales are flying. Okay, so can anyone tell me what in physics means these ones in the picture on the right are flying and the ones in the picture on the left are stalling. Left one's too much drag. Left one's too much drag, yeah. So if we go, if we think back to our first video that I showed you, uh, oh, sorry, the uh, second video I showed you where you saw that there was a, a void happening behind it's called turbulence so what comes off the back of the sail when you've got a very open leech like this you have minimal turbulence and therefore telltales fly beautifully and then when you have a very tight leech the telltales back because there's there's wind the 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 turbulence the you know the wind winds uh, not flying equally sorry to interrupt gareth sorry i've had a rethink on that You've had a rethink. It's not like well, it's not strictly turbulent. Like, it's turbulent, but it's vortices. It's vortices. Okay. Vortices. That's better to explain it because you can imagine it tumbling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good point. All right. Yeah, there you go. You see, that's that's why we've got someone who actually did a degree in naval architecture uh, as the backup. Um, so yeah, it, it, yep. E either way, you can see that basically the airflow on one side of the sail, in in the sail on the right. Both sides are equal, and then the sail on the left, the windward side of the sail, the airflow is good, but the airflow is bending around the back of the sail and causing what are actually sort of spirals coming off the back of the sail um, because the sail's choked. I'm just going to show you one more slide here, and this is just showing you the, the physics side of it. So as we can see, with a well-trimmed sail, airflow off both sides, we're getting lift, we're increasing that lift by, by pushing our angle of attack, trimming on the sail, still we have airflow. And when we're over trimmed, we're getting, sorry, Carl, what are we going with? Vortices. Turbulence, not cavitation. That's related to high speed aerofoils and not sails. Um, but yeah, there we go. Okay, still got everyone with that? 
But in an airplane, it's called stalling when you get to that bit. So what's it called in, in a boat? What, what do you call it when it happens? It, it is effectively, it's exactly the same. It's stalling. I mean, generally, we look at a sail and we'd say the sail is luffing or starting to luff. Or someone who, who thinks they're really smart might tell you that you're choking the sail. <laughs> I remember sailing on a boat once with a Scottish jib trimmer and, a, and an owner who was quite new to sailing driving this yacht. And every time we're going upwind, the guy trimming jib who is Scottish had a different terminology for you're pointing too high. And halfway through the race, he said to me, he keeps using all these different terminologies. I don't understand any of them. It's like, oh, he just means luffing. Oh, right. OK, cool. And then we sell brilliantly afterwards. Excellent. Any questions on any of that, anyone? I've got silence, Carl. You've, you've either done them or they've got it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt Very good, when, Gareth. Very good. I felt when I when I learned this sort of stuff that um, that really sort of helped me get the hang of what was going on with the sail. What is twist? What is what is going on with with the, the curve in the middle, the outhaul with the Cunningham? Do you understand what the airflow is? I think you can get the hang of sail trim and what all the controls will do from there. And you can play around with your boat, go out in different wind conditions, wang on the vang, see what happens to the telltales, wang on the Cunningham, see what happens to the draft, adjust your outhaul, see what happens to the power and the sail. Excellent. Right, Carl, I think it's probably a good point to hand over to you. Mm hmm. OK. Um... Let me come and share. Falling overboard. Yeah. <laughs> is he? Is he? Dropped out. Uh, on a, uh, we lost Carl. Oh, no. oh, he had lovely videos and everything. Okay. Give me back soon. Gareth, just uh, go back to uh, the graph you had with the sweet spot. Can you just yeah, go back sure. to that? Sweet. No problem at all. Wait a minute, I'll just go back to share screen. I was asking you a question, but I was on mute. <laughs> oh, you do do that. You did that a lot of the exec last night, didn't you? Yeah. Um, Quickly, quick, quick, is it me? Never. Oh, no, I'm in the wrong screen there, aren't I? It was. Stop share. Share screen. PowerPoint. Okay, sorry, Tony. Which one was it you wanted to look at? Okay, go, go the one with the um, you know, you the lines and the sweet spot and the uh, lines and sweet spot. Go on, keep going. Uh, it was a graph. Yeah. Just uh, that. Uh, what, what are the axes on there? What's the axis? The horizontal and vertical axis on those? Okay, so uh, the lower axis is angle of attack. Yeah. Here we are. We've got Carl coming back in now. Carl's rejoined us. Yeah, yeah, Carl, we're just going through a quick question Tony had. So you've got angle of attack. So that's the angle of the boom to the wind. Yeah. And then... <laughs> um, the other axis is actually different for all three things here. So with lift, it's showing your increase in the power. Okay. With drag, it's showing your increase in the resistance against the boat. So it's always lift versus drag. So as you pull the sail in, you're increasing the amount of power, the amount of lift that's making the sail want to work. But the more you pull it in, the more it creates drag against that. And then the blue line is showing the medium, like the most beneficial point between the two. So then where that 
intersects power, the green line here, that would be a sweet spot where the telltale stream perfectly. Okay, so there's different, different things for those different lines. But the main thing to think about when we're sailing is we're looking at the telltale. That's what teaches us all of that physics side we've just been through. Yeah. But I think when I learned about this, this actually then I could I could broaden this into a wider wider stream and uh, and sort of work out what I need to do to my sail shape to make it work in the in the um, in the conditions I was sailing in. Just quickly, have you? Oh, sorry, I'll, it's our, sure. Uh, go on. Yeah. Have you still got it? Yeah. Uh, the one that was two before that. Two before that. Two before. Oh. And just yeah. That one there. Oh, on yeah. Is that is that the same as the Wales Test wins over the last two years? <laughs> oh, oh, you haven't won in Cardiff for four years, mate. Sorry, Rob. Uh, for... Sorry, Kate Jones. Did you have a question? Yeah, and when you say you increase the angle of the tank, is the boom moving? Uh, uh, is it is the angle greater or uh, less or lower? to the wind and previously, if you're increasing the angle of attack? If you, if you pull the boom in, you're increasing the angle of attack. So okay. as you move towards the center line, you're increasing the angle of attack. Okay. Yeah. So what the boom is, you know, if you, if you were, let's say uh, an aero laser dinghy, in general, when you sail upwind, the outboard end of the boom is on the corner of the boat. And as you're sailing up, so, let's say the bottom of that green line would be that the sail was 60 degrees away from the center line yeah. and, and flapping. Yeah. And as you pull that sail in, it go, the lift goes up because the sail's becoming more efficient. You're yeah. in the perfect angle for the sail to be. And then the last little bit going back down, we've oversheated. Yes. Cool. Yeah, so the wax is his force then, is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That. In fact, um, Carl had a really good. Uh, I'll diagram. share it. I'll share it. I'll share it. I'll pass over to you, Carl. You got a great. I one. don't know. How, I don't know how much to log myself out last time, but there we are. I was trying not to do that this time. I was halfway through and I realised nobody was listening. <laughs> it's not the first time. All right, let's try it. Can we all see my screen? Okay. Let's make that bug. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, uh, this, is, this is just, again, reiterating what Gareth is saying about the telltales. Well, we looked at last week, didn't we, when we said the, the outside one lifting, we, we shoot in because it prevent that stall there. And then when the inside one's lifting, we bear away slightly or we let the sail out. Oh, sorry, we pull in. This one we let the sail out. The, I'll, I'll just show you a couple of things I've got just to sort of support what Gareth was saying. Um, this is a leech telltales, um, and this is on our scorpion looking from underneath. And we're interested in the top telltale here. This will just be in the dinghy park, I think. Um, we've just managed to get it flying there and it equates to this one on this screen here. It's the one we're kind of looking at most of the time to work out what's going on with the back of our sail. And I'm going to show you a few photographs around that and a little bit of video about that, showing how changing the angle of attack, i.e. letting the boom in and out, affects how that flies. OK, just to try and put it all into a bit more practical context. So I'm really proud of this picture on the left, Joe Barrable. It's looking absolutely at fabulous nice technique. Yeah, nice technique. Everything looking good there. So this beautiful yeah. arrow is sailed perfectly with all these telltales nicely lined, all the important ones, the two down here, and beautifully flying off the top leech. And the boat is beautifully flat, and we'll come to flat boats next week. Um, again, on the B14 here, this is Liam and Abby. Top telltale flying beautifully. Okay. So let's have a, we'll carry on with that in a minute. Um, oh, this is another picture I wanted to show you. It doesn't matter what sort of boat it is in a scow. 
It's another scale being sold beautifully. Everything's lined up nice and flat. Um, this is very similar to that diagram that Gareth showed you, um, increasing the angle of attack. There they are. And how the, the vortices come off the back of the sail. You're always getting some vortices off the very tip, but if you let it, you know, if you if you let it out too far, it's um, they're breaking off much sooner, and that's what's giving you that separation. And just to reiterate again, this is your sail. This is the wind coming at it. It's creating a net force. Right. So what I've done here is tried to show you the difference in those the sort of resolution of those forces when you're going close hauled and when you're going beam reach. Okay, so you've got the wind coming down the page. From what Gareth has told you so far, you can see that the sail or the sail plan, because you've got a main and a jib, will create lift in one direction and at 90 degrees to that, you'll get some drag. Okay. Then what that means is if you resolve those vectors, you, if you remember at school adding them up point to point, you get a net aerodynamic force, okay? And that's kind of pushing the boat away a little bit here from the wind. And what you do with that is you resolve it again into forwards and sideways. So what you find there is you can see you've got a big orange side force. Can you see that's the sort of resolving this, this net aero force again. You get a large side force and you get a very small forward thrust, which is what actually makes us go forward against the wind when sort of intuition says you should just go sideways. It gives you, there's just enough aero force pointing just forward enough that you'll get something going forwards. Okay. That's so I want to keep- And centerboard's well, generating that, is it? Say again, sorry? Centerboard's generating that force. Yeah, so the, 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 gen, the centerboard and, and the centerboard and the whole form and the rudder will resist that side force. So whatever force you've got on this side must be balanced the other side. Okay, so that side force is if you, in the absence of everything else, there will be another force balancing here, which keeps the boat pretty much tracking. I haven't shown those extra forces. I've just shown the aerodynamic effect. There's definitely a hydrodynamic effect, which must equal that aero force going the other way. So if we just think about the aero for now, the, on this one, same thing again, we've got a net thrust from the sail plan coming much more forward now on a reach. And you can see that whilst we're at the same angle of attack, roughly, the wind's coming at the same place on the sail plan. We've let, you've effectively kept the sail in the same place, but turned the boat underneath it, if you like. Reality is you turn the boat away and let the sail out. Now that force going forwards is much further, it's much further forward. And this is why you go much faster on a reach. So if you were looking at those America's Cup boats, as they bore off, the speed difference was absolutely massive. It was 20 knots difference as they came through a beam reach just below. They call that the kind of death zone in catamaran skiffs and falling boats. And just that bearing off 20, 30 degrees makes such a difference to this thrust vector going forwards. Okay. Are we okay with that? I just... I, I never see this summed up properly in most books and wherever else I see it. So I thought I'd just try and put that together for you. Yeah, nicely done. There's a lot more at work than that, but that's just the basics. Okay. Yeah. And just to put some context in of what Gareth has shown you there. Yeah. Um, the, the great thing about learning to sail or you, you, your career through sailing is that you always think you've kind of got the hang of it. And then you find out about another thing and another thing and another thing. But in the end, all these things are massed together and they, they become simple. Yeah, and, and you know what? You just get on and do it. You know, other yeah. telltales fluttering, yes or no. Is yeah. it, it would be my key message here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Gareth yeah. and I debated for about an hour and a half this afternoon about the, the finesse of this. So even we weren't, you know, totally yeah. sure or convinced in our arguments, you know. I think we're aligned now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, now what I wanted to show you was this effect of letting the sail out on a downwind um, leg, and sadly he's not in the room with us tonight. But it's um, he won't mind me showing you. I know that. So this is Richard Keatley Hansen a couple of years ago on a Saturday afternoon sail training session we did, and what we're looking at is the effect of. Um, let me just rewind that ever so slightly. There we are, that's it. We're having a look at the effect of two things. We're having a look at, um, trying to stop that, come on there. 
it's not doing a very good job. But anyway, you can see what's going on. The I won't point at it. If I point to it, it seems to cover it over. What you can see is he's got the wind dead behind him, so he's on a run, okay? Um, but what do you notice about that sail? What do we think about the boom and what do we think about the top of the sail? Chris. So who is that? Quite twisted. Very twisted, yeah. And what about that boom? It's high. Yeah. High, and what else? What do we think about the sheeting angle? So I'm almost directly alongside him. He's on a dead run in lightish air. What do we think? Could the boom go out anymore? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, couldn't it? And what I want you to see, can you just see that top tail cell? If you go up the leech from the number four, can you see his top tail tail slightly stalled there? Yeah. Yeah. So what's happening here is. I mean, think of it in simple terms. All the air is spilling out the top of that sail. It's coming out the back and doing the vortices at the top there. You've got that drag. And the sail's just slightly, you know, oversheated. It's in too much. So what we did with Richard while we were alongside was, I mean, I got him to do this deliberately so we could demonstrate the effects of it all. So it wasn't him sailing badly. <laughs> what we do here is we get him to... Trim his sail a bit better there. And he's just starting to let it out a bit. Let's just have a look. You know, it's still in the same place. Let's have a look. So there, he's, what he's done there is he's just adjusted his kicking strap for me slightly. Because somebody said earlier the boom was high in the air. So he's put the kicker on to pull the boom slightly down. And what that's done is it's closed the top of that leech there for us. Okay. He's still slightly oversheated in this breeze. I can still see he's not quite 90 degrees out with his boom. So when I'm talking about 90, I'm talking about the angle of the boom to the, the fore and aft line of the boat, if you like. And he says to me at this point, has that made any difference? And what you can see, I mean, I probably should have played the sound, is I'm trolling along next to him in the rib. And as soon as he makes that adjustment, there's no extra breeze. He shoots away. So it just shows how effective that changing that cell control is. Okay, we will get on. And now you can see as well that, I just caught it there, his leech is a lot better. The, the telltale is stalling a bit because he's still oversheated, but you can still see here, it's trying to fly a bit better. You can see that the wake coming off the, uh, the, the bow and the stern, you know, increases as he makes those sail adjustments, showing the boat's moving fast through the yeah. water. So now at this point, I'll try and move my thing away. He's let his sail out more, but because he's got some kicking strap on here, the boom's held down a bit. He's not letting the top spill forward. So this looks really nice. Now in a load of breeze, you won't get away with this. You can see how tippy the boat already is, but in the light air and flat water, that's rocket fast. Yeah. But it's really about the telltales I wanted to show you. And he's got a lovely little, um, we, this is really a single-handed thing on an unstayed rig, but he's got a really nice pant in the sail. So watch this. Just think of it, a seagull sort of flapping its wings, a nice, not too rigid. To <clears throat> it's just doing this nice like that. And you can just see that in his leech here. I'll just move back and let it roll forward. Just see there, the boat just beautifully, yeah, he's got it just right there. Okay, that's all I wanted to show you on that. So he's almost beyond 90 degrees there, Colin. He's reversed the flow. Yeah, he's reversed the flow and it's all feeling good. Yeah, yeah. and it's a really common technique in unstayed rigs. Um, as I say, if it gets too too windy, you what you tend to do is drive off more by the lee or come up a little bit. You don't tend to try and sell a dead downwind angle like that. Um, we're obviously in the lakes here and we're probably on half tide. So we're and it, the whole there's a whole group of us flying down there, but it, it, I just thought it was a great opportunity to get some footage of of the effect that makes. And it's very subtle because in the boat you can't really see it very well, so you're relying on the telltale. It's easy from alongside the boat, but when you're sat in the boat looking up, the only thing you've got to go on is really that telltale to know what's happening. And if it's windy, you'll feel it quite unstable as well in the boat if you haven't quite got that right. Oh, Carl, if the um, the the telltales at the top of the sail is streaming there. Mm -hmm. What are the telltales lower down on the sail doing? Here, um, yeah. on a run, not terribly much. 
not terribly much at all, because effectively on a run, a lot of the sail is stalled behind anyway. If you head up slightly or go by the leaves slightly, everything comes back into play and you reattach normal flow. It's actually very unusual in most boats that you ever dead run. It's just not the fastest point of sailing. You, you, you sort of sail a little bit of angle one side or another, unless there's a really good reason. You know, you're in flat water and you're on a big gust and you just want to sit on the gust for ages. You tend to just sail either side by a couple of degrees because of that flow detaching from the back of the sail too much. So, so is it true to say that only on a dead run do those telltales at the bottom of the sail become pretty useless? Absolutely. Yeah. And certainly in some... Well, your taser, you can dead run, but you would tend to tend to do a bit more with it with the jib projected to windward, don't you? You, yeah. you? There's no harm in going a little bit deeper with that. In fact, that's probably really quick in the taser, I would imagine. I need to find something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you've got Carl. a very rigid. Go on, go ahead. Yeah, Mike. Carl, if, if if the telltale's got wet um, in any circumstance, maybe a capsize or something. Yeah. Or rain. Is there yeah. anything else you could look for to give you an indicator of how how good the sail should be set? Yeah, it's very difficult on the leech ones. The leech ones tend to dry out quite quickly. Um, the ones that are on the sail, the woolly ones on the sail, tend to stick a bit more. So there's certain things you can do, like treat those. I mean, they used to say candle wax or things like that, anything over it to stop it sticking. Yeah, but so silicon spray. Silicon so, spray is nowadays, yeah. The, the other thing you can look at, I mean, certainly going upwind, is you're looking at this patch in the sail here, just for it luffing. If you've got, in the absence of all else, I mean, Richard, I don't think it's got any lower telltales here. So you'd just be looking in this area here to see if that's flapping or not. If you're oversheeted, very difficult to tell without any telltales or if they're stuck. So you're absolutely okay. right, in the rain or after a capsize, it does become quite quite tricky especially in the light to be able to read the sail correctly yeah. just shows how important the telltales just, are really just thinking of a sail when you're going upwind rather than downwind like this if you lose your cell tails if if we were looking at that that graph that uh, tony brought up earlier on uh, that i showed where you'd got the um where we we're trying to find the sweet spot that sweet spot is literally the point just beyond when the sail's been pulled it, it, so it's just slightly more in than when it's been flapping. You'll find that over trim is quite easy to do, but under trim, you'll find that, you, you know, if, you, if, if a sail's flapping, you pull it in. As soon as the sail stops flapping, you pull it in a tiny bit more and the telltales are aligned. Hmm. We could go into the physics on that, but I think we'd bore everyone's senses. I think we're done on physics, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you, mentioned, you mentioned the kicker just now. Yeah. About you know, tightening the kicker to get the, the you know, straighter rough and better cell shape. Better leech, there, yeah. That's is where you wouldn't want the kicker reasonably tight to keep that sail straighter. Um, yeah, in the light. I mean, the, the, it's, it's a very fine thing. Um, certainly in things like the arrows and the dawns and everything else. And in fact, we can probably show you something where you need to be careful how much you do with it. And that is here in this one. Um, so we'll just do the guys running past it. So this is an ex Olympic grade sailor that borrowed a boat for a day. As you can see by the sort of quality of his jibing, he'd never been in an arrow before, but he, he sort of got the hang of it pretty sharpish. Um, so going downwind here, he's got, it's got the boat nice and unstable underneath him, which you, in the light stuff is a good thing. Um, a bit hairy, but it's fast. Um, and your question to me was, where's the sweet spot on that kicker? You know, and looking at this shot here, he probably hasn't got his boom out far enough for the conditions, but the leech looks beautiful. It, mm. it, it's pretty, that's pretty spot on. If he let the kicker off any more, the leech would open too much. If he pulled it on too much, you'd close it down too much. So you've got to just look for the sweet spot all the time. So I, th I think a really good one there as a, as a rough tip, Carl, is uh, the top batten of the sail mm -hmm. being 90 degrees to the hull fore aft. So 90 degrees to the direction you're heading, the kicker, you, you know, you'll find that the leech profile, the, the, the twist in the leech looks about right on most single handers. Yeah, so he lets us sell out in a minute and goes. And then there's another one here where this is a really interesting one. It's very specific to the area, this. 
Um, it just happened to be areas who were training that day or a mix of things. But you can see in this photograph, or this video with Fee, what it looks like is it's got a big vertical crease down by here. And as I look at the sail up here, you can't really tell from this, but you can't see the telltales. So that's given me a clue that everything's stalled out and isn't in the best possible um, situation. You can also see that the boom's very high. So, yes. I mean, she sat to one side, so she's got a little bit of windward heel, which is okay in the, in the breeze, in the light stuff like this guy has as well. But what you can see is um, in a minute, if we get, let her go forwards here, you've got this big vertical crease down the sail and you think, oh, she's got Cunningham on, but she hasn't because Cunningham would normally give that. In an aero, what happens is when you go dead downwind, the mast goes dead straight and the sail isn't designed to be set on the straight mast. It has to be a slightly bent mast. So you put a little bit of kicker on just to put a tiny bit of bend in the sail and pull this section here where that telltale is. Can you see here the sort of most baggy bit? You pull it forwards and get this, get that out. So I'm just going to show you that as she does that. Um, if I turn the sound, I don't know how well you can tell you. If I try and share the sound, then you can hear me telling her. Okay, it's not too bad. Yeah, okay. That's all right. Just maybe the main out a bit more. It might just go all the way out. You're not quite 90 degrees there. Huh? Might just go out. What you might find is you let it a long way out. You might find the kicker's end too loose, but just have a look at it. You're just watching for the top of that sail not to spill off too much. Maybe now just feed a little bit of kicker in to get rid of that diagonal crease. Let's try it now. Kicker, that's it. Bit more. That's it, that's the one. Okay, could you see that? That what yeah. we did there, just the tiniest, tiniest amount made a massive difference to the shape of that sail. Um, I'm going to say it's very subtle on an error that, but it's because it's got a bendy rig, it's quite effective at showing you what, what goes on. You don't want to put too much on because you'll kill the leech again, you'll shut the leech down. But it just shows that, you know, it's a very subtle thing. So not only are we worried about where our boom is when we're going upwind, where our sails are, we're also starting to worry about where the, how the leech tail tails are flying. So I hope that brings it all into, into context. Um, if it's okay for the last sort of few minutes, I'd like to move on to the reading the water bit. Because I, I did, I found this fascinating when I was asked the question last week, and it's a real pet subject of mine, and I, I, do, I just think it's a fantastic thing. Because how else do we know what is going on? Okay, so this is a view off the seawall, um, walking around Oxy Lake towards Sultans, if you know it. Um, in the side over here, you can see Yarmouth or it's kind of sconce boy and where, where all those houses are. Um, needles are out through to the right there. And I guess the question is, without even playing the video, who can see the gusts on the water? Is it fairly the top obvious? Right. Top the right. top right hand side of the screen, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So if I dare to try and annotate that. We are talking all of this area here, aren't we? In fact, it's more, this comes over here. It's kind of that whole area, isn't it? And can you see how it, it comes down, hits the water, and then it's sort of fanning out as it goes? Yeah, it is really. So this kind of reading the water is really easy in flat water. So I'll just clear that again. What, what we've got is dead flat water inside Oxy because the, the, any waves are protected by the sea wall here. So this is like sailing on a lake. If you're at Queen Mary or Datchet or wherever, or Frencham's a good example. This is quite common to see the water like this and to be able to read it. It's the same in Limington in a northwesterly where the wind's blowing off the shore and you're close to the shore. You'll be able to read the water like this. Okay, it, it's really obvious. Where it gets trickier is if you're in the middle of the Solands um, and there's quite a lot of waves about, it's just not as obvious as this. And I think what would be quite good, Gareth, have you got that um, video to hand of Simon going upwind? I'll just load it up now, mate. We'll do a screen share, yeah. Yeah, do you want to do that? 
Yes, what I want to do is just talk you through very quickly on this, just to show you the difference. We, we won't worry too much about what's going on in the video, but it's more the, the conditions that I want to show you. The more real life for, for sailing in the sail. We're trying to read the wind if we can. And what's the focus? All yours, G-Dog. Two sex, mate. Just trying to find her for you. Uh, I did have it all loaded up earlier, didn't I? If not, I can move on and come back oh, to no, that. I don't mind. We got it. Uh, okay, cool. I'll just jump on the screen share there. Okay, share the screen. Okay, this is right. Yeah. That's the one. Perfect. Yeah, let's just, if we turn the sound down and just let it roll through, I think. So this is Simon Gaiman, who was on this uh, Zoom call with us last week, sailing in an RS100 about two years ago now, 2019. Yeah, the video's not coming through that well, Gareth, actually. Okay. You know, with it up the resolution on it, it's quite stalled. Uh, I don't know if I can up the resolution right now. Or oh, down the resolution, try it down. Down might this be good. Oh, there we are. That, you know, th that'll do there. Just hold that, freeze that. Okay, so here there are definite gusts on the water, but they're a lot harder to read because we're churned up. My suspicion is we've got a bit of wind blowing, you know, on a southwesterly here. It's, it's almost the same aspect as I've showed you in my footage, um, just obviously further offshore. So you've got the wind coming one way, and I think you've got the tide ebbing out through Hurst here. So you've yeah. got a bit of wind ever tide, the way those waves look. So that's the first thing to notice. We've got short, sharp waves. And that tends to suggest that the tide's pushing against the wind to rise those waves up. And th th this is classic Solent chop. This is real, very common to what we sail in a lot of time as soon as the breeze comes up. And so reading the water itself, so you, you've done one piece of read there, which is, mm, it looks like the tide's against that. The second read is, where are the gusts? And what you've got to look for really is the tight ripples on the top of the water. So where do we think looking at that shot can you see any tight ripples on the top of the water right hand corner of the picture's got some yeah exactly bottom right yeah exactly i mean that, that might be just a bit that's in focus but you can certainly see yeah just... you've got some coming on there see there it's not as subtle the other thing you have got of course is a bit of white water as well where maybe the waves breaking or it might indicate a bit more pressure you I... think you've got a better better aspect it mates, uh, it's oh. on the other. Hello, Charles. I'll just share an image. Oops, sorry, Rich, you missing. Ah, here we go. If this isn't coming out too well, we'll move on. But it just and here's the other thing actually I want to talk about. Just hold it there, son. Hold it there. Is I talked a little bit about this last week because reading the water is very difficult when you've got a mixed light on it. So can you see in the left-hand side of that screen, you've got the sun shining on the water. That makes it very left a bit more than that, Gareth. Just there. It's very difficult to start reading that. And that, that's not uncommon at all when we're out sailing. You know, we've got clouds around, we've got mixed cloud around, and just try to see what's coming. It's, it's not at all obvious. Um, but here it's kind of windy enough that we can feel it. And why do we think it's important to know when those gusts are coming? So you can, you can yeah. Go ahead, Darren. So if there's a gas coming, you want to prepare to make sure you're you're ready to keep the, the hull flat by uh, by leaning out. Um, yes. just to make sure that you're you're thinking about it and preparing for what's gonna happen. That's it. So if you're already flat now and a bit more wind's coming, you're either gonna have to do one of two things, well, three things if you're going up wind. You can either head up a little bit, you can hike harder, or you can let the sail out or do a mixture of everything, depending on how much there is. But you're anticipating, that's the word I'm looking for. You're anticipating what's coming. Okay, let's flick back to where we were, because we've got long left. Great. Okay. Um, I'll just let play through this, this one for you, then I'll show you another one. So this, I think, is a lot easier to see, isn't it? And what we can do here is we can track the gust. Can you see it coming down off the um, off the wall up here? 
Um, can I take that for you? You can see it starting to form here, yeah? And all the way across here. There's a little bit of something here. And as we play that on, can you see it working down towards us? Um, just clear those. You can see one coming there, you can see one coming down through here. They're coming through pretty quick. There you are, you can see it coming onto us. There you go. So that's the gust coming. And as I say, anticipating for it. As you come off the shore, the wind can be pretty, um, what we call unsteady. So the direction can change a lot. So even being inside here with that wall, this, I mean, this is very similar to sailing on a reservoir where you'd have a dam wall that's a fairly similar size to that in a lot of places. Just having that there is enough to break the wind up a little bit and cause some turbulence, a bit like we were looking at earlier, and cause this wind to shift about. Now I've got another video for you that I took today, which shows this um, a little bit more. It's that one gone, that's not quite to hand. Just grab that. Uh, here we are today. So this is taken today, and so I'll turn the sound down. So this is in a southerly, okay? So as we looked, again, it's almost the same footage, isn't it? Almost the same place. I'm looking from the same place on the wall over to the Isle of Wight, just a different day, and a different day to when you looked at that RS100. The wind's coming straight off the island. So as we look at that, that's due south. Yeah, the RS100 would have been pretty much in the middle of the picture, Carl. Yeah, it would have been, yeah, yeah, and that's southwesterly. And what's important here is the water's quite a bit flatter because you've got the island sheltering it, but this means you'll get a very unstable wind direction. Sorry, unsteady wind direction, let's use the right words, unsteady, because the wind's trying to come over the island, then it's doing a bit like our sails got all those vortices coming afterwards so it's doing goodness knows what in the direction the direction can be all over the place and every time a gust comes it's like to change direction with it so i just thought that would be interesting you won't necessarily be able to read that on the water but you can anticipate it and what we tend to do when we're racing is we'd go halfway up the first beat and just see what the gusts are doing um how are they responding you know when the gust comes on is it changing direction in one way or another you tend to get a bit of pattern to it so you, you you can anticipate it when you actually start so even if you're just going for a long sail you can do the same thing if if the gust hits me and i'm on starboard tack is it making me push me away from the wind or is it bringing me up towards the wind as it changes direction you can learn what it's doing and then obviously the nearer you get under the island shore um the worse it is and this particular piece under here is dreadful so this is that's the island that's the harbor entrance over there on the left just a bit further over the left and you come on to the end here, this is called Blackrock, this area. And just under the trees and the forest here, it's really bad news. Yeah, you get such a hole in the breeze. You can almost see the flat spot on the water. Can you see there's like a light patch in the distance there? That is the lee of the island. So that's where the wind just isn't making it over the trees and onto the water in time. It's coming back and beyond that. So again, that's kind of reading the water. So if I, I mean, if we were racing, we wouldn't be sent right in there, but you, you just, you can see it's an area to avoid, that's all. So Carl. Okay. Hello. So I was, I was out this afternoon. Oh, fab. Uh, and um, even at the mouth of the river, there was sort of about two to three minute, 20 degree shifts. Right. Uh, and then you were getting two, uh, every sort of 20 minutes or so, you get a sort of five minute period of no breeze. And then wham, it would come back with the 20 degree shifts. Yeah. So that was... It was moving around a lot. So what, what Richard's telling us there then, so he's used some key words. And if we were a tactician on the boat, that'd be really interesting to hear that every two to three minutes, I'm getting 20 degree shift. So what he means by that is the breeze is changing direction. Every two to three minutes, it tends to oscillate as it's coming off here. And then he said, I think the other piece of information was every 20 minutes, he was getting a hole. So what's happening with the with the gusts like this so not only have we got the impact of the island changing the direction for us 
but also vertically, we get vertical mixing of the air, which causes the gusts. And sometimes when you get a really big gust, it means that the parcel of air that's hit the water has come from quite high up in the sky. It's come, you know, because the further you tends to be as a rule of thumb, certainly in this low pressure we're getting at the moment, the further you go up in altitude, the stronger the breeze is. And one of those parcels of air has obviously come back from up there and popped and given us quite a bit of breeze. And then when it goes light, it means the air isn't getting as high as that. And I've got a great little di um, pro diagram, which I hope will show you that. Yeah, I think I've got one here, Carl, to I've show got the you. Egg. Hang on, it's the right Land prepared. Effect. Don't panic. Nope. Oh. Thought we threw technology at the problem. Okay, this is um, a free website called windy.com. It's where I use all my forecast analysis. And what you can see in this diagram here is time of day. So what time are you at, Rich? Uh, um, I suppose, was it one, one o'clock I was out, I suppose? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So what it's showing is these arrows are wind vanes, okay? So it's showing the direction of the wind. It's blowing from the south and up at more altitude, it's blowing nearly southwest. And the vanes on there, if you're not sure what those are, big triangles, 50, the long ones are tens, and the short ones are fives. So that's 75 knots but that's at a height of a lot. I forgot how that equates, but it's a lot. It's a long way up. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, if we come further down, kind of 1500 meters or so in this area, you can see we've still got that southwesterly at sort of 45 knots. And then at ground level, it's forecast at 15. So if ever you get a parcel of air mixing from up here, it's going to come down as quite a big gust. Okay. So the, the kind of, ground forecast isn't that much and you can see it's actually southerly at this point that's because there's some friction going <laughs> across the ground as well it changes the wind direction as, as the air hits the it hits sea level um this is what's going on in richard's case is it, it's mixing and then it's going quiet again it's unusual it'll have gone that quiet because even just at this height there's quite a bit of breeze there for it to pull down that's interesting when i was rigging the um the flags on the ionized station were just limp uh, and then by the time I got to the end of the river, we're back into a solid 20. I mean, bear in mind, this is a forecast on here, not actual. So if we yeah. were to look at the actual and correlate what Richard is saying by looking at the, what I do is I'll, I'll go to the um, starting platforms, really useful because we've got a wind gauge on there. And if we go and look at that, what we can see is the blue line is the mean wind direction and the red is the high and the blue is the low. So at... Um, let me just set that to a time scale that's sensible. Um, we'll go last 24 hours. Right, okay. So we're talking at this period of time today. So it doesn't ever drop that much, but certainly not out in, in the Solent at the platform. And yeah. the direction doesn't particularly change much. It's net southerly. So there's obviously something going on as it comes up the river. It's getting, you know, you've got a marina in the way, you've got land in the way you've got goodness knows what else by the time it reaches that flagpole in the southerly it's i think you're just in so much turbulent air there i think that's what's going on i've got another quick uh, little uh, illustration that i just found that's probably quite useful mm. for uh, our location as well Carl. Um, go for it can i just jump on the screen share where am i screen share and i want uh this one here we go lovely yeah that's great so it's just showing you just a really basic rough thing of like if you've got a was that a wind turbine or something on the top of a hill you get turbulence behind it if you've got a cliff you know this is showing the wind blowing at the cliff and going over but you can see there's areas where the where the wind goes against the cliff and then it's, it, it's swirling around and therefore probably back eddying down on the water. So if you're sailing close to a cliff, you'd see that. And then this third one, where you've got obstacles. you just got a house. And you can see the smoke on the chimney. You know, the smoke on the chimney is blowing that way. But actually down here, the wind would be blowing in the opposite direction. So this is really exactly the same as the Isle of Wight today. So if exactly. you'd gone right under that island shore where I showed you, the yeah. trees were effectively the house and a bit of elevation. Yeah. And then you've got this. Then also what Richard was seeing as well with the flag playing funny games. I think yeah. with the marina and all the masts and everything else we've got in the way between the winds yeah. as it comes up the river. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're getting a similar effect. 
if you think like if the wind's just traveling over the sea and the sea isn't too disturbed so you haven't got lots of waves the wind over the sea is going to have minimal effect and there's there going to be a much truer breeze you're not going to get so many oscillations in the you're not going to, so many variations it's not as unsteady yeah or and, and, steadier or steady but even with it just going over the harbour wall where Carl was showing those videos of the gusts that he saw earlier on on the sea wall, you know, as it goes over that, just that little bit of land that it goes over is enough to throw the turbulence right up there and really sort of in a very direction, very just. And uh, what, what's, what's interesting on those sea wall ones, actually, if you really took it to its extreme, is the sea wall is actually bending the wind as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, you can see that in the streaks that are on that video I showed. The, the, I've got some other videos where it shows it. But as the wind hits that wall, it's actually bending it around. Now, where we sail out in the Solent, that doesn't matter so much. But if you ever go lake sailing, that's really relevant. If you've got that's a high obstacle next to you. There's quite you, an interesting... Yeah, you'll get that, yeah, into the mouth of Oxy when you come off of Bavistock on the south, on the southwest. Yeah. That's right, yeah. A very interesting one. Well, I mean, if you think Livington's... Uh, most constant breeze is probably a, a southwest or a west southwesterly. So it's coming through between Hurst and uh, I can't remember. Yes, the it, it, yeah, it's Fort coming, Albert. Fort Albert. Yeah, so it's coming through that gap there. And what you actually get is is very much a fanning effect of the breeze. When the breeze channels through, the edges slow down, and therefore you get a pulsing breeze. So as you sail, you, you'd see like a certain curve in the breeze. Would you like to see a video of that? <gasps> <laughs> Do you, do you want to unshare a minute? Go on. Uh, I, mean, there. I think I don't know whether we've blown everyone's heads off yet or not. Everyone's still there. Good God. Amazing. They're going to sleep well tonight. They are such tenacity. It's amazing. How did you switch this off, by the way? Yeah, <laughs> about that. <laughs> I know whose voice that was. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> recognized right so this is looking again on my dog walk a few days ago i think it was last week this is looking we're on oxy lake again but we're looking up what i call the canal so it's up to the lock gate up here and yeah. saltons is over on the right so you get this lovely expanse of water at high tide that is you mark if you ever sell a scale you'll go around that um and what i'm trying to highlight here is gareth's point of and this is totally unprompted is as this is mimics the wind coming out of a channel or it's coming out of a channel. And it's exactly like Gareth's talking about coming through the gap in Hurston or Southwestly. And it's, I, I quote, it's like water coming out of a hose pipe where it splays as it comes out the end. So you listen to my commentary on this, if it can hear it over the wind, it should talk about that. Okay, so we're in Oxy Lake looking up at the canal. Um, you know, the lock gate comes out and what you can see there is the wind's flowing out. It's, it's like discharging out of a pipe, if you like, the water coming out the end of a pipe. You've got exactly the same with the wind coming up. So just to highlight that, if it's not entirely clear or it's not playing very well on the video, what we're talking about is, so you've got, that's one edge of the channel and that's kind of the other there. So we're talking about across here and we're talking the wind blowing down the channel like that. And as it comes out, it's doing a bit of this. Mm -hmm. And you can see the gust here in this area. And it, the light on the water again is killing it slightly. You can't see it, but certainly over this way, you can feel that that's doing that. Can you see how you've got a light spot mm -hmm. under the trees over here, but you're definitely getting the breeze coming out and fanning like that. Fanning effect. I think, I, I don't know if everyone remembers, but back with sort of uh, O-level GCSE physics, there was like an experiment that everyone had to do where you had, you made a wave in a, in a, in a low pool of water and then the teacher would put like two um harbor gates so you found a narrow and then that when that wave went through it did the same thing it fanned it's a natural it's uh not doppler effect it's another one but it's a natural occurrence that when you put one force through a narrow it then fans yeah it's a discharge well it, it, yeah it, We'll look up what it is. I'm sure I've got it really I think it, I think it's a discharge effect, but yeah, it, it's you're talking about a slit experiment, aren't you, for wave refraction? Yeah, but the same thing works with light, works with wind, works with with water. You know, and and all these things are very apparent to Limington because we've got that channel just to the southwest of where we sail all the time. 
if you're not careful, we're going to end up in uh, quantum physics. I'm starting to feel like Brian Cox, where I always thought I was more Picasso. Anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the last one I wanted to show you on Reading the Water. I thought this was interesting. That's lovely. Well, what do we think is going on here? And I'm particularly interested in this area. Oh, hang on. That's not going to do it. Escape that. Ooh. I've outsmarted myself. Let's try that again. What do we think is going on in that area there when we're looking at the water? Water's getting shallower. Yeah, that's exactly it. So the water will always tell us. Now, in this case, it's very shallow. I mean, that's a minute later, the ducks are walking on that. But it's just, I just thought it was a really interesting, you know, thing of making it really obvious about looking at it. And when you're out in the Solon, um, the certain areas are obviously quite shallow. I mean, down the middle, it's Bramble Bank. Um, up on the right-hand side, inside Pennington Poo Pipe, that's quite, you know, you see the, the waves breaking there. You see it, the waves changing as you come out of the river and turn right or left, where, because if you imagine the river's dredged for quite a way to get the ferry, but there's a sudden change in depth there, and you see the waves steepen, and that gives us a clue that something's happened. <laughs> And again, as we come in shore, the waves become sharper and steeper. And again, it gives us an indication that something's going on. So the reading the water thing is quite, uh, to say, I, I'm fascinated by it. Yeah, I, th I think that the, the, a book I, I probably referenced last week called Dave Perry's Winning in One Designs. It's one of my favourite books on sailing. But in that, he talks about when he's not sailing and... Uh, for his competitive edge, he always tries to work out which toll booth on the New Jersey Turnpike is going to be the shortest key for him to get through. And he says that just helps him with his tactical brain. But then he says every time he ever sees a bit of water or a river, and he just looks at the effects of a river flowing, a stick or a tree or something in the river, what happens to the water around it, it all plays a part with what you get on the ocean. It helps you figure out your, your environment that you're sailing in. It's, yeah, and that, that's a really good point. You know, I think I highlighted that as well last week. You know, when you're walking by the coast, it's just watching the water all the time, just learning to yeah. absorb it a bit more. And just get, and it becomes reflexive almost. The other yeah. thing about Gareth's point there with the, with the turnpike thing, the, the you know the toll booths, the something a, a really good sailor said to me once when he was in the car. He said sailors have so much more anticipation when they're driving, <laughs> and it's because of this whole anticipation that we think. You know, you, you're planning ahead more. You you your brain's more, it's a bit like the racing driver thing, isn't it? You're more reactive and yeah. you're thinking about what's coming and what's coming in from you, certainly on your peripheral as well, because we're yeah. quite used to that, you know. We're always conscious of, is that a ferry, is that a motorboat, is something coming behind us? Even the men are the multitaskers. Sorry, even the... Even the men are better multitaskers. Turns out, subconsciously. As long as it's <laughs> not a proper job you've been given. You know, it's... Uh... <laughs> But when you're sailing, there's so many things we're considering all the time. And uh, and what we try to do with coaching is we try to take the, you know, millions of different mathematical formulas and and physics lessons and so on out of what we see in front of us and break it down to simple things like a telltale, like a shape of a gust on the water, like a dark patch versus a light patch and sort of see you know, signs that then we intuitively know what we can read and anticipate coming towards us. Yeah, that's probably a great place to start. Have we got any questions? I think we'd, I said we went quite deep into the theory tonight. I promise not to do that again. I won't probably. let him. Oh, come on. <laughs> that was brilliant. Quick question, quick question on the, uh, for, for, I don't know if Richard or you, you guys, but the 20 degree shifts that he was experiencing today, is that largely because of the island? And if it was more westerly, what what's, would that would there yes, be less? Yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah, the, the, the wind would be, yeah, the wind would be less unsteady. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The topography is, is was causing that today. Okay. So one of the things you get off the island, which is interesting as well, is there's a narrow valley, or which if I just show you that quickly. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the yard, isn't it? Yeah. So. When it comes out the yard, can you see it from this one? You probably see it from where I'm showing you here. Yeah, you can see yeah. here there's a valley here at the river yar and in a southerly as you get close to that the gust does exactly the same as we we're showing you on that thing it fans out so when i used to exo d race we were quite often sent over there and i'd always be looking for that in this wind direction i'd be looking for that extra breeze coming off the low land there um and knowing not to get tucked up under this crap 
but certainly you would <laughs> use that, you know. Technical term. <laughs> it's, either, it's the other white, it's not England. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I had to go there this, this last week. Oh, uh, mate. I had to go get, abroad. Did you get double jabbed? <laughs> oh, mate. And um, Kate Jones, did you have a question there as well? No, no, that's fine. No, no. I just, I was just saying, it's brilliant. It's fantastic what I'm learning. Good. <laughs> oh, that's positive. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Anything else? You. Any other questions or observations? <laughs> we're, we're, what I'm thinking of next week is we'll move on to a bit more keeping the boat flat. Yeah. Um, which is a bit more Less, visual. We've physics, got some videos physics. and photos for that. I think you should bring Joe in for that. Seeing the picture earlier on. Yeah. Uh, I'm very proud of that picture. Yeah. Top hiker. Yeah. Very proud. <laughs> She's gonna look shy now. Yeah. <laughs> you muted Joe. I, I, rem I was saying to Carl earlier on. I remember when Joe. Do you want came... another one where you're not doing that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> got plenty of bad sailing. Not. Oh no, it's a beautiful picture. Joe, Say again, Joe. Do with your boat, not me. <laughs> oh yeah, right. -o. The boat and the coaching. I think. I, Joe, Joe cruised for me in my Merlin once, and she was she we were sailing up wind and quite a bit of breeze. I think it was Joe, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, and I was like, oh, gusts come in, hike hard, and uh, and and I felt nothing. And then I looked forward at Joe, and she was absolutely hiking textbook flat. Perfectly everything. She just weighs nothing. It made no difference to me getting my fat ass over the side of the boat. It made a lot of difference. <laughs> I think there's a bit of a change there now. It's known as lockdown weight, Carl. Oh, we've all got it. Don't worry. <laughs> anyway, we'll shed it off before we go sailing, I'm sure. Right, I gotta go and have my tea. Thanks, thanks very much, guys. Thank you, guys. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks very much.